بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى جميع إخوانه من النبيين والمرسلين وآل كل وصحب كل ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and protect his nation from that which he fears for them. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, let us first have the proper intention in our hearts to attend the lesson for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Bukhari narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Khayrukum man ta'allama al-Qur'ana wa'allama Meaning the best amongst you is the one who learns al-Qur'an and teaches it. It's very rewardable for one to learn al-Qur'an to understand the meanings of the words of the Qur'an because the one who understands the meanings of the Qur'an the proper interpretation of the Qur'an when he is praying and reciting Al-Qur'an will think about the meanings of the verses of the Qur'an he is reciting and that will help him have more khushu'a in his heart. More khushu'a in his heart. He can remember the day of judgment, what's going to happen on that day, because he learned the meanings of these verses. He will have more fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his heart. And whenever he goes, whenever he wants to do something, he can remember these meanings and that will help him become pious. Because if you think of Allah's punishment, then that will help you refrain from committing that sin. If you think of Allah's rewards, if you perform that act of worship, that will help you be motivated towards performing that act of worship. So it's very important to understand the proper meanings of the Qur'an. And as we explained before, these days there is no trusted copy of the so-called translation of the meanings of the verses of the Qur'an. Those who wrote the translations, they wrote what they understood from the Qur'an so, and based on the wrong understanding to the proper meanings of the verses of the Qur'an, they wrote the translation. That's why a person who doesn't read Arabic, he would rush and he grab a copy of the English translation and starts reading. And he thinks this is the proper translation of the meanings of the verses of the Qur'an. Where in fact, there are many misconceptions mentioned in these books, unfortunately. We'll continue, inshaAllah ta'ala, Translating the meaning of the verses of the last part of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is comprised of 30 parts and we are explaining the meanings of the verses of the last part of the Qur'an known as Juzu Amma. In our lesson tonight, we'll be talking about the meanings of Surah Al-Infitar 
Surah Al-Infitar is comprised of 19 ayahs, verses, and it was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was in Mecca before he immigrated to Medina. Allah Ta'ala said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Iza Samaun Fatwarat, meaning when the sky is cleft asunder, ripped apart, split apart. So Al Infitar, and that's the name of the surah as well, is the clefting of the skies asunder, the splitting of the skies. On the day of judgment, the skies will split apart. They will have crevices, openings like cracks. It will have like cracks. Here is a crack, there is a crack, and there is a crack. It becomes weak. Now these seven skies are very hard, solid, and firmly constructed above the earth. The thickness of each sky is 500 years. And Allah Ta'ala said, وَبَنَيْنَا فَوْقَكُمْ سَبْعًا shidada." Allah created seven solid, well-structured skies above you. So they are very solid and hard. But on the day of judgment, they will have crevices, cracks. They will be weak and they will split apart. After that, the seven skies will be joined to paradise. So will be part of paradise. وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُ تَثَرَتْ And when the stars fall off, drop from their positions, the stars and the planets, all these objects are constantly moving. However, some of these stars and planets rotate in the positions so without leaving the position while other planets would change their position from one place to another but they will be always in that space between earth and the sky now the north pole star it's called polaris can be seen obviously very easily it's a very bright star it's fixed in its place however it rotates it moves but in its place so it turns around while remain fixed in its place now other stars will move will change place so as they are turning they change from one place to another all these stars and planets will fall off on the Day of Judgment. They will drop from their position. وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ فُجِّرَتْ There is another recitation for this ayah without double jim. So it is recited with one single jim then it will be pronounced as وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ فُجِرَتْ فُجِرَتْ Meanings, meaning when the seas and oceans are flooded, they will overflow and overflood. That's on the day of judgment. وَإِذَا الْقُبُورُ بُعْثِرَتْ and when the graves are tousled, that means on the day of judgment, 
the graves shall be agitated, turned inside out and upside down, split open, and the dead shall be resurrected and quickened, meaning they will be brought back to life. So these graves will be tousled. What is inside will come outside and so on and the dead will be brought back to life and they will be resurrected the graves will open and they will come out of their graves in an, a hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was talking about himself and he said i'm the first one whose grave will be opened on the day of the judgment and I'm the first one to be resurrected. So on the day of judgment, these graves will be tousled, what is inside will come out, the graves will be opened, and people will come out of their graves, and that's called resurrection. Also, it was mentioned that the people of Mecca and Medina and At-Ta'if will be the first ones to be resurrected. So the first one to come out of his grave is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the people of Mecca, Medina and At-Ta'if will be resurrected before other people. Alimat nafsum ma qaddamat wa akharat. Meaning then every soul shall know the acts of obedience it has brought forward and the obligations it missed out. And this ayah is a reply statement for the previous four ayahs. Meaning, when the aforementioned matters will happen, when the sky is cleft asunder, split apart, and when the stars fall off, and when the seas and oceans are flooded, and when the graves are tousled, then every soul shall know what it has brought forward amongst the acts of obedience and the obligations it missed out. So every, every person shall be able to see what he has brought forward amongst the acts of obedience and what he has missed out amongst the obligations ordained upon him. Ya ayyuha al-insanu ma gharraka bi rabbika al-kareem Here al-insan generally it means mankind. But in this ayah it refers to a specific type of mankind and that is the non-believer. Because it was revealed, this whole surah was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was in Mecca. Those who disagreed with the Prophet regarding the day of judgment, regarding the resurrection and the Qur'an and they doubted the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned some of what's going to happen on the day of judgment and that everyone shall know on the day of judgment what he has brought forward amongst the acts of obedience and what he have missed out amongst the obligations. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the blasphemer amongst mankind, saying, Ya ayyuha al-insan, O mankind, referring to the non-believer, Ma gharraka bi rabbika al-kareem. What has seduced you to turn you away from the obedience of your Lord? the most generous and most forgiving. 
So the ayah addresses the blasphemers by asking what has seduced you that has drawn you away and cheated you to the extent that you have blasphemed and disbelieved in your Lord, the most generous and most forgiving, who bestowed upon you a variety of endowments. Now seduction here refers to the matters that entice man, such as money, prestige, desires and devils. al Baydawi said the answer to the question, what has seduced you, is the devil. So that's the answer for it. What has seduced you, enticed you, to the extent to make you turn away from believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The answer is the devil. The devil seduced them. The devil decorates the wrong for the person to make him attached and charmed by that wrong thing. You don't know or you can't imagine what ways the devil would use to, to seduce someone. He has millions of ways to come to a person to seduce him. And it was narrated in the hadith that the devil runs in a human being as the blood runs in his veins. So he can think of millions of ways to seduce a person. To what extent? To make him in the end become a disbeliever. That's the main objective of Satan and his followers amongst the devils. To seduce people, to make them become non-believers. Now he would come to the believers to seduce them, but if he finds out that it is hard at a certain stage to make them jump, from believing stage to the disbelieving stage, he tries to use other ways to drag him slowly, with or without realizing. Now let me mention this story to you. Just to take an idea, how would the devil seduce a person? Ibn al jawzi in his book, Talbis Iblis, mentioned that in the past there was a girl living with her three brothers. Then one day the king of that area ask these three brothers to go and fight by his side. So they had to go but they were worried about their sister where they can put their sister while they are away. It's very dangerous to keep her alone. They started asking people, would you be able to keep our sister with you until we come back? Everyone said no. They don't want to take that responsibility. Then they directed them to go to a person who used to live on the top of a hill and he had built next to his house a small place where he used to go and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that place. Next to his house. His name was 
الناسك برصيصة الناسك برصيصة he was he dedicated his time to worship Allah however he was ignorant about religion he wasn't that knowledgeable but he wanted to dedicate his time to worshiping Allah so they said go to that person they went to him first he refused then he said to them I'll accept with one condition that she sleeps in my house and I sleep in that place where he used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there because he can't stay with her in the same house and that's called khalwa that's haram they said okay and he promised to look after her they went with the king and that they gave him money to support their sister so once they went he started going to the marketplace every day buy food then come up to his place put her some food in front of her door knock on the door then go up to his place he used to do that every day then she would open she would take the food inside and she would eat then the following day he would do the same then one day Satan came to him now this person has dedicated his time to worship Allah however he was ignorant about religion wasn't strong if the devil were to come to him straight away ordering him to commit blasphemy that person would refuse so he came to him from a different avenue he said to him you are buying her food and she's at trust her sisters so her brothers entrusted you with her so instead of looking after her you just throwing the food at her door then you go into your place maybe she needs something why don't you stay and ask her if she needs something then that person knocked on the door and stayed there she opened the door now Islamically they are in a place together with no third person that will be classified as khalwa so being together in a place with no third person and that's forbidden so he said to her do you need anything she said no then he left her and went up he continued doing that for a while then he came back to him and he said to him the devil satan you are putting her the food and asking her you think if she needs something she would ask you she would feel shy to ask you why don't you go inside the house and check by yourself if she needs anything if there's anything missing then he started going inside checking all around putting the food inside then going up to his place then Satan came to him after a while he takes his time then he said to him you are buying her food every day you go into the house you go in inside you're putting her the food then you're going up, you eat by yourself and she eats by herself. Don't you think if you eat with her, that will help her because her brothers are away from her? That means that will help her because she's alone. She won't feel lonely. From what corner he came to him? From what avenue? He can seduce him. Then that person, because he was ignorant, he didn't think about khalwa, he didn't think about these issues. He followed the seduction of the devil. So he started going inside, staying with her, eating with her for a while. Until one day he slipped and he fornicated with her. 
So fornication is a major sin. So from al khalwa to fornication. Then she got pregnant. When that pregnancy became apparent, he started thinking, what should I do? If her brothers come back and they see her pregnant, they're going to kill me. Then Satan came to him and said to him, if you kill her and bury her, then when her brothers come back and they ask you, ask you what, did, what happened, and you tell them she died, then they will believe you. So he went to the house and he slaughtered her. Then he buried her behind his house and he made a fake grave in another place. So from khalwa to fornication to killing a Muslim unjustly. And that's the most enormous sin after blasphemy. He killed her and buried her in that place. After a while her brothers came back. They went to him to receive their sister. And he started crying. And he said to them, she died. She was very sad that you are away from her. And she couldn't handle this. And she died and I buried her in that grave. They went to that place thinking it was a really grave. They stayed for a while. Then they went back home. During that night, Satan came to every single person in his dream. And he told them, did you believe that person and Nasik Barsisa that she died because she was worried and depressed that you've left her? No. In fact, he did such and such and such and he buried her in that place. When they woke up in the morning, everyone was shocked. Everyone had words to say. Then one said, I saw a very weird dream. The second one said, me too. And the third one said, me too. When they discussed what they saw in their dreams, they said, we have to find out what happened. They went to that place, they dug in that place, and they found their sister slaughtered. And she was pregnant. And they knew the whole story. They went straight to that person, and Nasik Barsisa, they dragged him, and they tied him up around a tree, and they brought the sword to chop off his head. At that final moment of his life, Satan manifested in front of him, appeared in front of him, and said to him, prostrate to me, make sujood, prostration, prostrate to me, and I'll save you from them. So he lowered his head like this, giving a sign that he's making sujood to Satan. So he worshipped Satan. He committed shirk, kufr, blasphemy. He worshipped other than Allah. Once he lowered his head like that, they chopped his head off with that sword. So he died as what? As a non-believer, as a blasphemer. But would you ever think he would be dragged from that place to blasphemy using all these ways and avenues? Iblis, Satan and the devils, they have millions of ways to come and whisper to the person and drag him to unlawful things to eventually achieve the main goal which is to make him what? commit blasphemy. Also it was narrated that Satan Iblis has like a throne in the sea and he sends his soldiers every day to whisper to people then they come back at the end of the day one would say to him, today, I made a Muslim miss out one prayer. He will be happy with that news. 
Another person will say to him today, I made a person, a Muslim person, commit fornication. I made a Muslim drink alcohol. I made a Muslim do such and such, and so on. When a devil comes to him and says to him, Today I made a Muslim commit blasphemy, he will give him a crown. He will crown him. Because that's the utmost goal of Satan. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, when Satan was banished, what did he say? قَالَ فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ I will drag as many as I can with me to hellfire, to the wrong path, to become non-believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatened Satan and his followers that Allah has prepared hellfire for Satan and all those who follow him amongst the devils and of the jinn and amongst the non-believers amongst mankind. So that's why for you as a Muslim you need to help yourself. In other words you need to be always around the circles of knowledge in the mosque something that will remind you to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because once you drift away from the right path you become easily attacked by the devil as if there is a shepherd who is grazing his sheep if one goes away from the herd of sheep, what happens? It will be attacked by the wolf. So the wolf will attack that sheep that is far away from the herd. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith. So you are away from your brothers who will remind you to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You become an easy bait for the devil. He will attack you and he will drag you away and away and away until that's his ultimate goal to make you become a blasphemer. We ask Allah to protect us from falling into blasphemy and from committing other sins as well. So, Ya Ayyuhal Insanu, O mankind, and that's referring to the non believer, what has seduced you to turn away from the obedience of your Lord, the most generous and the most forgiving? Al Karim is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it means that Allah is a forgiving one who does not punish the sinner shortly after he commits the sin. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him time to repent before he gets punished. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned his name Al-Kareem here to emphasize to the blasphemers the importance of refraining from being seduced before the punishment eventually befalls them. So, Allah's ascription here of being al karim does not mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the blasphemers. No. The blasphemers will not be forgiven on the day for judgment. In this life, Allah gives the believers and the non-believers amongst the worldly benefits and the worldly pleasures. You find a non-believer who has money, who has good health, who has 
very big wealth, has children, has good reputation amongst people, and so on. All these worldly things are his reward in this life. Why? Because after life, he has no reward. He doesn't even get one speck of reward. One single unit of reward, one hasana, he doesn't have on the day for judgment. On the day for judgment, when his deeds will be weighed, all the bad deeds will be placed in one pan, and the other pan for the good deeds will be empty. We'll have no one single reward on the day for judgment. They will be gone. Allah Ta'ala said, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا will be blown away. All what they did amongst the good deeds in this life will have no single reward on the day for judgment. Because they are non-believers. Also Allah Ta'ala said in the Qur'an مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ كَرَمَادٍ اشْتَدَّتْ بِهِ الْرِيحِ فِي يَوْمٍ عَاصِفٍ Just imagine, in a very windy day, stormy day, if you have ashes on your hand, and you go outside, in that very windy day and stormy day, what would be left on your hand? Nothing. Ashes, blown away. So Allah Ta'ala made this analogy between the good deeds of the non-believers and the ashes being placed outside in a very windy and stormy day. As these ashes will be blown away, nothing will remain. The good deeds of the non-believers will be blown away on the day for judgment. وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا will be blown away. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that in the hadith as well. He said, as for the non-believer, Allah will give him in this life. But when he comes on the day of a judgment, he will find nothing. In this life, Allah gives him good health big wealth, children, good reputation amongst people. But when he comes in the hereafter, he will find nothing. No reward for the non-believers. They will be dragged to hellfire, will be thrown in hellfire, and will remain in hellfire forever. Because in this life, they were arrogant and stubborn. And they had the intention to remain disbelieving in God till no end. So if they were to live forever, they're going to keep that blasphemous belief in their hearts forever. And that's why they deserved to be in hellfire forever. And there are many verses in the Quran that outline the everlasting stay of the non-believers in hellfire. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا Many ayahs indicate this. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا They will dwell in hellfire forever. They will never be sent out of hellfire. That's why you have to think about yourself. If you commit a sin, then you find yourself not getting punished in this life. Do not continue committing the same sin or even more sins. Repent to Allah immediately. Before you get punished. And note that some of the sins Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes the one who commits them in this life on top of what is saved for him to the hereafter. 
So this punishment is not a substitute of the punishment in the hereafter. No, it's on top. So some of the sins, the one who commits them will be punished in this life. Then on the day for judgment will be punished as well. Unless forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of those sins is harming your parents severely. If you harm your parents severely, like swearing at them unrightfully, hitting them or any of them, then that's a major sin and you deserve for doing so to be tortured in this life before the hereafter. Think about this. Can you tolerate the punishment of Allah? No. So if you commit a sin because you are a human being, repent to Allah immediately. Rush to, to repent before it's too late. So one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al Karim. Allah does not punish immediately the slave after committing his sin, the sin. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him time to repent. This is because Allah is the most forgiving and most generous. So repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the well-known people in the past called Muhammad ibn Sabih ibn As-Sammak who was a role model for others he wrote a poetry in which he said Ya katim al-zambi ama tastahi wallahu fil khalwati ra'ika غرك من ربك إمهاله وستره طول مساويك meaning all oh you who is concealing the sin aren't you ashamed Allah sees you even when you are alone you have seduced yourself by the fact that Allah allowed you some time so you may repent before punishing you as well as by the fact that Allah has not uncovered the long history of your sins. So if you are covered, if Allah did not expose you amongst your family members, amongst your close friends and relatives, repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. Just imagine if you, when you commit a sin, something happens to your body. You have like a lump in your body whenever you commit a sin. How miserable you're going to look at that time. Because you commit sins, you're going to have all these lumps in your body. So repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. If Allah covers your sin up, then it expose you amongst people. Allah covered it up for you. Repent to Allah. Repent to Allah, the one who did not expose you. And the one who did not punish you yet for committing that sin. And if you repent, it will be wiped out. You will no longer be questioned about it. And this is the magnificence of Islam. If you want to repent, the door of repentance is open for you. Come and repent. No one stops you from repenting. You have time. Before it's too late, repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about one person before this nation who killed 99 lives 99 people he killed them but he wanted to repent after killing 99 people he went to a person he said to him 
I have killed 99 people. Is there a way for me to repent? Then that person said, what? You killed 99 people. And you're asking about repentance? There's no repentance for you. Then that person got frustrated with his answer. Then he killed him. Made them a hundred. Now he killed one hundred. He wanted to repent. He's, he asked people. He said to them, direct me to someone where I can go to and he would be able to teach me how to repent. Now they directed him to a scholar. But that one wasn't a scholar. Was an ignorant practicing Muslim. But now they directed him to a scholar. He went to him and he said, I killed a hundred people. Is there a way for me to repent? That scholar said to him, and what stops you from repenting? Nothing. There is no barrier, he said, between you and repentance. Just repent. But to help you out, you have to leave your area and move to another area. Because you are living in a bad area, bad people around you, so they will influence you. In that place, in that area, there are righteous Muslims. So if you go there, they can influence you in a positive way, where you can practice your religion. So leave your place and move to that area. He said, okay, I'll do that. He packed up everything and he traveled to the other area. In the middle of the way, he died. He was in the middle. The angels of mercy descended and the angels of torture descended. They came together. The angels of torture said, he's ours. He never did anything good in his life. He killed a hundred lives. He was very bad. The angels of mercy said, but he repented to Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent another angel to be as a judge between them. And that is for a wisdom. And they appointed him as a judge between them. He said to them, measure the distance. If you find him closer to his original place, then the angels of torture will take him because he's closer to the bad area. If you find him closer to his destination, then the angels of mercy will take him. They measured the both distances because he's in the middle. They found him closer to his destination by one span. So the angels of mercy took him. In the hadith, it is narrated that apparently when he died, he was closer to the area that he left, to his area. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered this area to come closer to his destination and ordered his area to go away further from him. And by that he became closer to his destination. This is proof about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another narration, it was mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his body flip over after his death. By flipping over that way, he became closer to his destination. Then the angels of mercy took him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. Allah is ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim. But that doesn't mean if you don't get punished for committing a sin, you keep doing the sin. What are you waiting for? For a punishment to come on you? Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it's too late. We stop up to here, inshallah, tabaraka wa ta'ala. We'll continue explaining this surah next week, inshallah ta'ala. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We say, La ilaha illallah three times.